advertising probably works even better on children because they can't discern whether or not this is something they really need. And then you have children, you know, fighting over that. The disparity between have and have nots is more evident in children when public schools are moving to wearing uniforms because children are fighting over Nike shoes or um, I think their self-esteem, they grow up and they, they realize they can't have all of those things. And I see our economy is shrinking. We can't buy, I can't provide for my family what my father hoped to provide for mine. So at some point I have to explain to children, you can't have everything that you see on television. You don't need everything you see on television. Money was one of the big jumps that we made in the beginning. We cut working hours in half, which meant salary got cut in half, which meant we made, needed to make a house move. Uh, so it all kind of worked together. Right. Our kids were smaller when they, uh, we first started out, and they had some questions. They wanted to know, why do we have to move? And so we had to talk about that. Um, we had some kids come over to play that did not necessarily feel comfortable um, from our old neighborhood, come to our new neighborhood to play that didn't feel comfortable, and so that was uncomfortable for them. But after a couple of years, um, I, just the other day, they said, you know, it's easier than it used to be. They don't care so much about some of the things that uh, they'd felt pressured on before. And so I think in the end it's been, well I know in the end it's been good for them. I remember our kids responding to having less money around the house, but our kids already were learning that we may have less money and can't keep up with the other families in, in purchasing clothing, for instance, with certain names on it. But I remember my daughter saying, but we have our dad back and that made it worthwhile. There are a couple of schools of thought on television. One is to say that if you have cable and, and 49 channels, you can choose really good programming for your family, for your kids, etc. And uh, we've opted the other way. We have two stations that we can get for free, and we choose not to have any others. And for us, that works very well because our kids are playing and learning on the computer, and they're making things, they write stories, they play with each other, and they, they interact better. And so we feel that uh, time-wise and, and energy-wise and values-wise, uh, it's a good idea not to have too much of that. We treat TV as a treat. It's not something that's just always available. It's kind of like dessert. And we choose the programs that we want to watch together. And it's, it can become a family event, uh, which is good TV time uh, versus bad TV time. <laughs> One of the issues that seems to be everybody's issue is time, time management, not having enough time, um, wishing you had more family time. So one thing that we've done that's really been helpful is that we limit, at least we try to limit, um, activities to two nights a week. And it's not that you always get two nights a week, but uh, if it gets more than that, then the offending party um, is told. <laughs> and that's been very helpful because we, we are uh, busy on two nights, but the rest of the week belongs to us. And if, if meaningful activities steal time from the family, we let it happen. There are times when there are emergencies or special needs, but then we don't feel bad about stealing the time back for us later. The thing I find so amusing is that we tend to live our lives backwards from what we really believe. Uh, if we say family is a priority, then we need to give time to family. If we say a spouse is a priority or God is a priority, then we need to give time to God um, and let the boss be second or let other obligations be second. And we have that choice. It's like there's another voice telling us we can't give our time and our energies to the things that are really important to us, and we have some choices there. One of the gifts of simplicity um, is learning to laugh again. We found that when we were out of sync or out of pace that we quit laughing, and that's one of the danger signals that should go up. If people um, realize that laughter has disappeared out of their household or out of their life, um, that they need to do something about that. My first year of college when I went back, I was not fashionable. I was not a fashionable freshman because my father believed in the basics. So when he asked me what I wanted for Christmas, I said, Dad, I just, can I just have some new clothes? And so he told me, he said, well, okay, we can think about that. But before we went to buy clothes, you know what he made me do? He says, I want you to go in your room and take all your clothes out of your closet and hang it up right there. And I tell you, it seemed like I was, it was never ending stream. You know, by the time I'd hung everything out there, he said, now, uh, did, uh, did, did I understand that you need some clothes? One of the things which is very different from my life as a kid in India, from a life of a kid in India now and U.S. now, is the number of toys we had. Literally, we had no toys. We made our own toys. I still remember uh, as little boys, we would collect the fruit of the palmera tree, cut that into two halves, 
and put a rod in between and use it as a little scooter to run around the streets. So there was, I think, we were doing much more creative stuff, making our own toys. That is something very different. I find an additional problem there because uh, I have to make decisions as to at what points my children would be adjusting themselves to this culture and be like everybody else. And what are the points at which they would keep their Indian culture. So when we have that kind of a struggle, when the children are trying to define themselves within a culture which is not theirs, they cannot afford to have too many things different from others. And one of the things very difficult to be different from others is the way you dress. So they are, in a sense, compelled to go for the kind of brand names which their friends and peers might wear. And at that point, we have to say, OK, we give in. Uh, we can't say none of us would wear these. So in a sense, we have given in at those points of consumerism just to help the children to feel at home in a different culture which is not there. For me, living in community means that I have learned what interdependence is all about. I think that's a very biblical concept. Uh, we're taught in this culture to be very independent, to look out for number one, to make sure that I get what I deserve. And when you live in community with other people, our community happens to live in the same general residential area. We don't all live in the same house. Some single adults live together in a house because they think it's less expensive, which it is, and they enjoy one another's company. But most of us live within a five or six block area, and it makes it possible to share newspapers, as my, one of my best friends does. She shares a newspaper with two other families. Um, the four of us share two cars. Um, we share magazine subscriptions. We share childcare. We have meals together. To live in community is very important for children, at least it was for our children. Um, I can't imagine raising children now if there were not people of faith who shared the values that you share. Uh, there is too much going on around them from the kind of tennis shoes and jeans and the kinds of games and hanging out at the mall has become a national pastime for our youth. If you don't have a community of people around you who say, this doesn't have to be. We can get together in the evening and we can play games and we can do things together as a family and join with other people who share those values. I think that's how our children have to learn that, that they're, they aren't just kooky all by themselves, that there are other weird people who are willing to step out and be weird with them. Live simpler in the sense that, not to take away, I mean, we still have cars and we still have pets and we still go visit our relatives in the other states. Those are family foundation things. Simpler are like, and I'll just use it, and everybody talks about it in the magazines, you got the Nintendo, and you got the three bikes, and you got the several options of um, sailboat school, then you have kayaking school, and then you got those options. Are, are they, when you do those things, is that the real world, and are those the people that you deal with when you grow up and you have to live with, and when you're in the workforce, and when you're in society? As a child, if I were to stay in front of the TV and be on Nintendo all the time, how am I going to be able to relate and be with the people in this planet and on right here in my own hometown? I wouldn't know how to talk to them. I couldn't just walk up to a neighborhood and start jamming with them because I wouldn't know how to speak their language. We were all taught to be citizens of the global community. We were taught that there was no person that would ever be a stranger, that every person was our brother and sister and we would afford them the same courtesy, the same affection that we would afford someone in our intimate nuclear family. And the wonderful part also that really was special for me personally was being around elders all the time. I was the youngest of five siblings. So I had a real opportunity to just leisurely be surrounded all the time by wisdom. And the longer I live, the more I see we don't need much and our children don't need any more than anybody else's children anywhere on this earth and even though I'm put down in a setting with a country where I have 
a lot around me and I can consume a lot and I have a lot of material blessings and, and educational blessings, it's still for me a, an option of how much do I take and why do I take it.